El futuro despierta. Bienvenido al Congreso Futuro. Despierta, conéctate, participa. Es un placer para mí estar aquí en Chile y compartir esa aventura que es la ciencia con todos ustedes. Para mi charla la voy a hablar en inglés. Espero que funcionara bien para todos. Pero si tienen preguntas, por favor, también, si quieren preguntar en español, ni problema. It is my pleasure to be here today and to actually share this adventure that is science with all of you. For thousands of years, this question whether or not we are alone in the universe has been open. And I can't tell you today whether or not we are, but for the first time in human history, we have the technology to find out. And one of the things, being here in Chile, or being Chilean, is that this is the country that from the ground allows us our deepest view into the universe and also in the future when the European extremely large telescope with 40 meter of diameter will be finished. That's in 2022, so just a couple of years from now. The view from Chile, from the Atacama Desert, will allow us to search and hopefully find signatures of life on other planets. So with that, uh, this is the view that Thomas just showed you with the telescope up in the north in the Atacama Desert. And I titled my talk, Exploring New Worlds, because we are exploring new worlds in the sky. Thomas already showed you some of the first images, the photos we have of other planets that were his first graph, where we took a mask, blocked out the light of the bright star, and you saw these other points around it, these four planets that are huge. They are bigger than Jupiter, but we're practicing because with telescopes this big or small, you can find the big planets. But with telescopes that are bigger, you can collect more of the light and therefore you can find smaller planets that are just not as bright because they are not that big. And this is exactly where our research is leading. So let me just give you a little bit of a view of our place in the universe. This is our galaxy. If you go from one side and you see also our sun here, if you go from one side of the galaxy to the other, it's a hundred thousand light years across. It's huge. Light, the fastest speed that we know, takes a hundred thousand years to get from one side to the other. So if you want to see or if you observe a star on the other side of the galaxy, the light that reaches you now tells you about the past. So every look that you have into the sky, and please go tonight or go any other night, it's not just that each of these stars are other suns and we're finding their planets, their other worlds, but these stars, depending how far away from us they are, give us a view into the history of the universe. The further away they are, the longer the light needed to reach us. And so astronomy has the other pleasure that we can actually look back in time and figure out what a young universe looked like. But this is not what I want to talk about today, but 100,000 light years is the size of a galaxy. And when we talk about the search for planets, most of these planets, and we're talking about 2,000 planets we've already found, and thousands more that we basically have to still verify. Those are in this tiny, tiny region that you see here. 
they are within about a thousand light years. So we have found over two thousand planets, and we have not even explored a fraction of our galaxy alone. And our galaxy has billions of stars. And we now know from Kepler results that Maria will talk a little bit more about that every second star, if you count one, two, has at least one planet. And I'm saying at least because we can't find the really small ones yet; they're just too hard to observe. So they can only be bigger. So there seems to be billions of planets alone in our own galaxy, and the galaxy is one of billions of galaxies. In the universe, so the numbers you would say are actually in our favor to find other worlds like ours out there. And let me just point out one other little thing. I told you this is how our galaxy looks like, but we actually do not have a photo of our galaxy. Think about it this way:、um, there's a pizza, and the pizza has, let's say, a salami slice on top of it. To have a picture of that pizza, you would have to go really far away from it and take a picture. We don't have any satellite that has. We have one satellite that went out of our own solar system, but that's not even the next star. So we cannot have a photo of our galaxy. But we can have a look at all the stars around us, and then we have a look at the other galaxies that we spot in the sky. And then we can say, "Ooh, we must look like this if we could take a picture, because we know what the distribution of stars around us is in the galaxy." And so we take the image of another galaxy and say, "Really, this is what we look like." While the engineers are working on a satellite that's going to make it further away. And so now the question is, well, if we have billions of worlds, that means they must be pretty easy to find. Well, they're incredibly hard to spot because they're so small. If you take our own Earth, you can put it a hundred times next to each other. That's the diameter of the Sun. And now try to find something this small next to something that big. But the technology has evolved so that we can. But most of the time, and this is why Thomas stressed this beautiful image so much, we don't see the planet at all, because the way we find them is indirect. When the planet moves around a star, it tugs on the star. It's like when you walk a dog; the dog actually leads you. The bigger the dog, the more you have to lean back to hold it if you want to have a stable environment. And so, if there's a massive planet going around the star, a star will wobble back and forth, and that's what we can see in its light. If the star, is, if the planet is smaller, then the star will wobble much less, and so it's much harder for us to pick those up. So most of the planets we have found are small,、uh, are big planets, but we know we are much better in finding the huge, massive, big planets. So we can calculate how many of the big planets there have to be because we can find all of them roughly, and how many of the small planets there have to be. If you only find 10% of the small planets because they are so hard to pick up. But you know, it's the same number, or even actually more, than the big planets. You can say there must be so many more small worlds out there. And so the other thing is what you see here: the star wobbles back and forth. But if by chance, let me make this a planet, the planet goes between us and the star, so it blocks part. My face is the star right now. It blocks part of the stellar light from our view. So to us, the star appears temporary, a little less bright. And this is what you see here on the other animation. Yes. So the star is bright, and then when the planet goes in front of it, what you see is that it loses part of this brightness because a star is incredibly hot. And if you can see part of its hot surface, it will appear to be darker. Have a close look. When the planet goes in front of the star, part of the stellar light 
gets filtered through the planetary atmosphere, through its air. And that allows us, over huge distances away, to figure out what is in the air of another planet, of another world, to find signatures like water, carbon dioxide, oxygen that we breathe. And this is how, over light years away, we can figure out whether or not planets are like Jupiter right now, because we can do this for big planets, but in the next couple of years, if they are like the Earth or not. If you have the radius of the planet that we find by it blocking light from the star, and this is the number of planets we have here on the y-axis, the details aren't important, but you see that on the right are the big planets, and we can find basically all of them. But the number is so much slower, so much lower than the small ones like the Earth. So from that we know that there are many, many, many more small planets out there. And that for me is exciting because I really would love to find other worlds like ours within our lifetime. I told you that the distances are huge. The distances are huge, and really to get a bit of a feeling for it, this that I'm showing you here is Voyager 1, launched in 1977, and the only man-made object, the only satellite to ever have left our own solar system. It basically is the only man-made object, and it has a record of music, of pictures, of literature on it should it ever, ever encounter somebody else out there to show what humankind is like, because the distances are so vast. But before it left our own solar system, what it did is to look back. And that was on the idea of Carl Sagan, one of the important astronomers and astronomer, but overall, also a person who strongly believed that science is something that combines us all, that connects us, that curiosity is a human trait that allowed us to leave the caves, find fire, and today sit in this beautiful room and talk about the next frontiers. But if we now just do a scale model to have a little bit of a feeling for the vast distances in the universe. If I take all the planets in our own solar system and I actually shrink it to the size of a cookie, then the next star, the next sun, is two football fields away. And I take football fields because I hope everybody in the next football game that you're watching Astronomy will be the first thing that comes to your mind. So the distances are vast, but how does a planet look like, even if it's within our solar system, if it's so small as the Earth? So this is the image of our own Earth that Voyager took. And Voyager was at the edge of this cookie in our scale. And who already has, who knows this picture? Sorry, can I get a show of hands? This picture shows our own Earth. Do you see this white point here? Until today, this is the picture that has been taken from the widest distance from our planet. We don't have any other one. This is our planet from rough, roughly the distance of, uh, of the outermost planets, Saturn a little bit more. But look how small it is, how fragile it is. And I think this whole search for other lives, our place, our going into space also reminds us how much more we have to take care of our own planet, what also, of course, is part of this discussion of our future. Because yes, we're finding other worlds, but this tiny dot that you see here, fragile, beautiful, within the vastness of a dark space, is everything that keeps us alive and that makes us strive. What I find beautiful in all of this is that this planet is a normal planet around a normal star, but all of us have actually evolved to question what is our place in the universe and to look out and to look for other worlds and to understand our planet better because we find these other worlds. 
Now, what I'd like to have to understand if the planet that we're finding are like the Earth is this picture. And that's what we usually know, our satellite picture. You see continents, you see oceans, and so on and so forth. But that picture is not going to be able... We can take that because, remember, alone within our own solar system, this is the tiny dot that you see, and we haven't left this cookie yet. We haven't gotten to the next star. But if you take that light and you actually don't want to resolve it, but you split the light into its colors, like a rainbow when you go out, when it rains, the white light of the sun gets split into its individual color. You see the red, green, and blue of a rainbow. We can do the same thing for the tiny dot of light of other planets. And then if you check how bright it is in the blue, in the red, and the green, that tells you specifically what the composition of the atmosphere, of the air of this other planet is. It's the absorption features, because the stellar light, the sunlight, hits the molecules in the air of a planet. When it hits the oxygen molecule, it's O2, it will vibrate and swing differently than if it hits CO2 that's made out of three elements. And so a very specific energy will be missing in the light that gets all the way to us and we collect in our telescope. And therefore, we can pinpoint what is going on on other worlds. And for the Earth, our history has, of course, changed the air that was in our planet. The dinosaurs had a different air. The first life had a different air than we have right now. And the sun will brighten. It was, only, it was much cooler early on, so our atmosphere had much more greenhouse gases. And now it brightens. And by adding CO2 to our air, we actually accelerating the progress of making it hotter and hotter on our planet. But if the history of the Earth is also the history of life, you see that life was around for a very long time. We're around for the last fraction of a second if you take this as a 24-hour clock. And all of that, whether it's simple life, advanced life, or potentially intelligent life, that is part of this history. And the atmosphere, the air, that was part of the history of the Earth. That one you can read in the fingerprint of this planet. This is how one looks like, and don't worry about the details. But if you split up the white light and its color, you'd expect the straight line here. And if something is missing, if energy is missing, this is the energy that hit one of the molecules and made it move. So it's not coming all the way to us anymore, it stays in that planet and gets emitted in different directions. But so an early Earth looks very different from an Earth right now. But what you have is the signature of oxygen with the signature of methane. This is the fingerprint of life that we're looking for because if you see that in an atmosphere, something has to produce a huge amount of oxygen. Um, and that, from all we know, is life. And let me just leave you with one thought that's not necessarily my field. We say we're going out and we're looking for life. And we're looking for intelligent life. And usually the first association we have, as always in history, is I'm looking for you and me. Maybe I'm looking for somebody like from the movie from E.T. But if you followed the news, yesterday they announced that they have defrozen an organism on the Earth, it's called a tardigrad, tardigrad, and this is what it looks like, and it was frozen for 30 years, completely frozen. They found it in the Antarctic, it was the Japanese team at the Japanese base, the Chilean team can do exactly the same, and they defroze it after 30 years. They gave it water, they gave it food, and it happily moved on, and it happily laid eggs, and everything's fine. So, our view of what we're finding and what we're looking for in these other worlds has to encompass life that lives on the Earth, but that we usually don't think about, that lives in extreme environments, because it could change the color of a planet. This is how we can see it. And so a planet doesn't have to be this pale blue dot that we know from the Earth, but it can be all different kinds of colors.
We have already found a dozen worlds that are the right distance and are the right size, that they could be another Earth. The next step that we're working on is actually looking at their color, at their atmosphere, and trying to figure out if they could be habitats for any form of life that we know, and if we could find signatures of that life in its atmosphere. And so our own planet, this pale blue dot, really has our own fingerprint, the life that we know. But the other planets that we see on the horizon could have a completely different form of life and will teach us how an Earth works in the first place. And then hopefully we can take that knowledge, understand our planet much better, and take care of it a bit longer because we don't have the means to fly yet, but our eyes are open, and especially with the telescopes we build in Chile, that will give us the first opportunity to find out whether we are alone in the universe. Thank you. El futuro despierta. Bienvenido al Congreso Futuro. Despierta, conéctate, participa.